We're gonna start with the trailer. Okay, Thor, hit me. Ah! Avengers! Assemble. Get Avengers and Game on Blu-ray and digital today. It's a lot of movie. I was watching that trailer going, oh my God, how do we ever make this film? <laughs> <laughs> a little daunting to yes. bring all of that together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you, but the uh, obviously pretty complex uh, effort here, a lot of different characters, storylines, all of that. Is it the most complex project you've ever worked on? Uh, hands down. Yeah. I mean, uh, no question. I, I would argue that it could, probably was the most complex movie ever made. It was very, very difficult. I mean, we, you know, when Marvel sat us down and asked us to direct these movies, they basically said, hey, we're going to make the most expensive movie ever made, and then two, you're going to get two weeks off, and then you're going to make the most expensive movie ever made again. <laughs> and so literally back-to-back -back films, I mean, it's, a, it's staggering. It's a real testament to our team uh, that we were able to pull these movies off and that my brother, are still stand, my brother and I are still standing. So... Um, I really, uh, uh, you know, you can't, you know, these, these movies require 6,000 people to make. Yeah, crazy. And uh, just even scheduling the, um, the cast was one of the most complicated puzzles that mm. you could possibly imagine. Well, we have pretty interesting jobs here, but definitely not as interesting as yours. What's a bad day at the office for you? I mean, you know, it's interesting. There's no, you know, we love making movies. So we're, we're, we're in that fortunate category that we love what we do for a living. And we're very happy to go to set every day and figure out problems. We like to do that. And, you know, we like to, uh, um, you know, set, set goals and targets and, and hit them. Uh, and so, I don't know, bad days for us are like, you know, we love action. We love uh, making action movies. But action is actually very, very hard to shoot. It's complicated. It's monotonous. Uh, it, uh, it's very slow. You know, because it has to be methodical because you're, you've got safety you have to worry about. And, you know, there's like, you know, fumes on set and smoke you're inhaling all day long. So those can be the tough days to just yeah. physically hard on you. But, you know, other than that, there are no bad days. Well, you've seen technology change a little bit through the yep. years. What do you love most about where technology is and what are you looking forward to? Another analogy we've used is that we're, you know, when we make these films, we're like kids with a really expensive Lego set. And um, you can basically accomplish anything you want to accomplish now on screen. Obviously, you need a company like Disney and Marvel behind you with the resources to support that. But anything we imagine, we can put in a film. And, uh, and a lot of times, you know, these movies require an intense amount of preparation. But we can get to set. Our team is so good and literally change our mind about what we want the CG to be, and they'll be like, great, we'll figure it out. And, uh, and then we'll spend 20 minutes sort of figuring out the geography of how that CG might work. But even in the moment, you know, we've reached that point with technology where in the moment we can make a creative decision uh, that, that can cost a million dollars and, and it can be accomplished, irrespective of the money, it can be accomplished, just physically accomplished. Yeah. Well, that's a, a good note to uh, think about. So going back to when you were a kid, when the uh, Joe Russo universe began, what, when did you know you wanted to get into filmmaking? Like, was that an early thing? I was a pop culture junkie. You know, I don't, uh, I, I consumed a lot of content. I read, I, you know, I collected comic books. I watched anime. Uh, I watched, you know, reruns of all kinds of crazy TV shows. I went to the movie. I mean, I was the kind of guy, kid who would go like see Crawl like four times in one day. Um, so I just loved content and I love genre content. And then as I got into my teenage years in high school, we had an amazing uh, English professor who got us into um, art film and understanding thematics. Then we had a, a, a Cinematheque open up nearby that um, played a lot of foreign films. So I went through a foreign film phase. So we had a lot of facets to our upbringing. And I, I think it was just purely off of, you know, you know if you're going to ascribe 10,000 hours and become an expert at something, I certainly tabulated a lot of hours consuming content. I think everyone could probably say that today, because I think everyone's got PhDs in content consumption now. But 
uh, and then it just it led us down a path that um, that uh, you know we ended up shooting a, a movie on credit cards uh, uh, when when we were like 21 and 22, I think. But you had people noticed you right away, according to some of the articles I've we, read. I mean, we certainly got lucky. Robert Rodriguez had made a film called El Mariachi for seven thousand dollars, and he wrote a book about it. I think there were some added costs in there that Miramax had put in once they bought the film that were not uh, accounted for in the book. But it still represented someone with no access to the film industry taking a limited amount of funds and resources and making something that you know, turned them into an established director. And we thought, OK, well, we'll give that a shot. And you know, at the time we did it, I think Sundance was getting 2,000 submissions. Uh, a year because it it had it, it had fed this craze uh, for you know people making micro budgeted movies. We made one in Cleveland. We didn't know anyone in the film business. We didn't know anything about the film business. We called the one guy in Cleveland who had a camera and, and called himself a, a DP because he was working on a few sort of commercials at the time. And uh, uh, and we read some books and figured out how to make a film. We got lucky because it turned out, it took us two years to make it, but it turned out good enough that it got the attention of Steven Soderbergh. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and Soderbergh is really the reason I'm here because he coached us through um, our next project, got our next movie uh, made, which is called Welcome to Collinwood, and then that led to a show called Lucky, uh, that led to Arrested Development, that led to an Emmy, and then 10 years making television comedy, then, then led to Marvel. So it's a 23-year you know, overnight success story. <laughs> well, you certainly have made it look easy for uh, people who would like to emulate. Also, the lessons here are do something you love, that you're passionate about, but with people who have big budgets, right? That's Did I right. Get all that? <laughs> Work with people who have money. Yes, exactly. Uh, so tell me about what it's like to work with your brother. I, mean, I have two teenage boys. I can't yeah. imagine them being productive, let alone <laughs> working together. I mean, it's, it's great because, one, I don't know that a single person could have accomplished those two movies back to back. I just don't think it's physically possible. Uh, so there's real value in having two of us, and we subscribe to something called the mastermind pr principle, which says that two minds are not doubly better than one mind, they're exponentially better. Uh, and so there's this, you know, this unquantifiable you know, value to having two brains on something versus one. Uh, and um, you know, we get along great. We both grew up loving you know, very similar things, both loved movies, so it was, it was an easy access point for us. And you know, frankly, We've fallen into these roles and have for years where, you know, when an idea comes up, one of us will just assume the contrary position so that we can vet the idea and we'll argue about it for an hour. And then either the idea sustains or we come up with a better idea. Uh, but I think that process has been very effective for us because nothing, nothing gets through unchecked. And then when you disagree, one of you says, I'm going to call mom. That's how it works. <laughs> I mean, we've got to that point now where it's literally like we can. People will like be freaked out because we'll, we'll you know, we're Italians. So we're very passionate. We're in the room, going, "No, that's bullshit. It's never going to work." And uh, uh, you know, and and then you know, five minutes later, we're like, "Okay, great. Let's go get lunch." Like it's it's a process that we go through that you know uh, um, we leave in the room. It's because we're family. If we weren't family, I don't know that the partnership sustains because. With family, it's easy to just forgive and forget and walk out the door because you grew up having arguments with each other, so you understand what that is. Uh, and so it's very easy to like let that stuff go. And obviously it's working. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the movie a little bit. Sure. Who's your favorite character? I mean, growing <laughs> up, Spider-Man was my favorite character. Oh. Um, I collected a lot of Spider-Man comics. Obviously, I could relate to him being a kid. Yeah. Uh, I just find this idea of being uh, um, burdened with such responsibility at a young age and tragic responsibility is really compelling. And I think we, we like the more Shakespearean elements of comic books. I like when there's you know, uh, flawed characters dealing with uh, uh, loss or trying to overcome their own humanity. I love that, you know, Tony Stark in the books was dealing with an addiction problem. And the, these are things that everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. and, 
And it's ultimately, I think, why you go to the theater is you're there for the character moments. Um, because your brain can only handle you know, about 30 seconds of action or spectacle without you know, some, some semblance of a narrative or thrust to it. Uh, and those character moments are what provide that, that structure. Well, your films are amazing at bringing that humanity to life. So clearly, uh, failure was a big theme for this movie. Uh, can you tell us about a time when you failed? I mean, it seems like you've had a ton of success. Did any of that I mean, fuel this? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think you learn more from your failures, failures than you do from your successes. That is, un that is absolutely 100% true because they stick with you more. You know, a success is something that you can package and go, great, I, I did it, everyone's happy. What's next? A failure is something that like haunts you every day that you wake up and you go, what were the mistakes I made and how do I, how do, I do better next time? That's where the real lessons lie. And so I think it's, I think it's valuable to have failure because I think it's, it's important to know what it's like not to succeed and also to know what it feels like not to succeed because then you don't want that to happen again. Uh, and so the, what we learned, the one thing I think that's most important to us is that we learned to, to, not, uh, to try to not to predict uh, what people want. You can't predict it. They, nobody knows what they want. They all want different things. You get on the internet and you know, read comments, and everyone wants something different from these movies. So if we were trying to anticipate what it was that the audience wanted, we were bound to failure. Um, we use our own internal metric our own sense of taste, our own desire, because we got to live with the story every day. I got to care about it, I got to be emotional about it, mm -hmm. and I want to get out of bed to, to tell it every day uh, and to spend the time on it. So uh, that's the mo most important thing we've learned is make sure that we tell our story and then hope that other people like it. And the last point I'll make on this is, you know, if, if you try to anticipate what people want and you make that and it doesn't work, you're going to get up every day feeling like crap, that you, you didn't listen to your own internal voice. Uh, but if you make something that you care about and that you love and it doesn't work, you're going to wake up feeling a lot better about yourself every day. Uh, and, and that's the hard lesson that we learned from our failures. That's a great lesson. Yeah. I wish I had been a lot more comfortable with failure earlier in my life because if you're not failing, you're probably not pushing yourself. You're that's not right. trying hard enough. You're not taking so enough risks. It's a benefit, not a, not yeah. a negative. Uh, do you ever go to the theater and just like try to see what people are feeling? Like, do you love to watch? We like, do. I mean, that's an corner? important part of it. I mean, if you want a, a closed medium, you can write books and then get them distributed, and then people over the world could privately read your stories. We make these because it's a public medium, and we did grow up in a big Italian family, and part of our experience of growing up was sitting around a dinner table, entertaining each other, and telling stories to each other, and that's, that's where I learned how to tell stories. Um, and so sharing that experience with people is critically important to us. Also, we're paying it forward. We grew up going to the theater as kids, uh, watching Star Wars, watching Empire Strikes Back, Indiana Jones, Jaws, being moved in theaters and, and being moved by the spectacle and walking out and thinking about that and, and having it affect us and change us. And I want to do the same thing yeah. um, uh, for other kids. And we hope that one day they'll become the new storytellers. Uh, and so uh, uh, um, you know, ultimately for us, you know, sneaking into a theater every now and then is really a reward for all the hard work we've done because when you can sit in there and, and have people respond with joy and passion and pain and, and, uh, and they can be surprised and engaged and cheer and, and yell at the screen, that is, that is really the, uh, the pinnacle of, of being a, a filmmaker is engaging the audience in a way. Uh, and I think with Endgame, we saw, I think, one of the more unique moments in movie history because we've never had anything like the Marvel Universe before, where you have a 10 years of really, really successful, multiple franchises interwoven into one big narrative. And you know those franchises reach different kinds of people all over the globe and pull them together. Uh, and, uh, and so no movie's ever had that kind of momentum behind it. So really, and I don't know if anyone in here was, you know, went to opening weekend or the second weekend, 
and you had a really, you know, re really active and engaged crowd. But that is very, that is very rare for a film to get that kind of response in theaters all over the world. Oh, what a cultural moment, too, that you were able to bring together all of these different characters in a very inclusive way uh, from all different parts of the galaxy and all that. It just felt to me like it was a really important message at this time in history, too. It, it is critically important, and we don't hide the fact that we infuse these movies with the thematics that are important to us. You know, part of our process sitting in a room when we break the scripts, they're talking for two or three weeks about what's going on in the world and how we feel, my brother, uh, myself, and, and the writers, Marcus McFeely. Uh, and you know, we talk about what, what is making us anxious, and then we figure out how to turn that into a story, and traditionally, we'll give that anxiety to the villain's plot. Um, if you look at uh, uh, Winter Soldier, it's about the surveillance state. How much should the government know? How much control should the government have? Can we trust the government? You know, there's a, um, uh, and that's, it's not asking like the simplistic questions of can you trust the government, it's can you trust the apparatus? Because the apparatus can allow for uh, things to happen that are, um, that are, that are contrary to, uh, to sort of community oriented uh, uh, goals. And then Snowden came out, right, while we were in the middle of a post on that because it came out of our anxieties and other people's anxieties about what was going on. We're not hiding the fact that you know, Thanos is a you know thinly veiled metaphor for climate change and what where this planet's going and limited resources. And my I have four children; they have to inherit this Earth at some point. What yeah. are they, what are they going to get? So, it's all worked into those films. And I think because those movies are, they're pop culture films, you can digest those ideas in a way and you can process them. And also, what I think is fascinating is that you can reach audiences around the world with those, with those messages. And, uh, and uh, for us as artists, that's, that's critically important. Well, and you've clearly done that with this movie, so congratulations. Thank you. Tell us, uh, you have a production company, Agbo? We do. And what's, new, what's next on the horizon for you? So for us, I mean, what was really nice is that we're able to take a, you know, the branding that we built off of these Marvel films and parlay it into our own films and television studio. It's called Agbo. Uh, you know, we're self-financed and, and again, we're artists paying it forward because Steven Soderbergh held the door open for us all those years ago. Yeah. We're now trying to hold the door open for other new voices uh, that, can, that have something really compelling to say. Uh, and um, uh, so it's really the, the function of the studio. We're calling it a storyteller studio. Marcus and McFeely are our partners in the studio. So all the, the process that we learned you know, where Kevin Feige would pop his head in the door and say, I need Civil War by, you know, April of, you know, 2016. We go, great, give us uh, four months and we'll come up with a script. That's a very focused and disciplined process that is required to execute in a time frame like that, mm. under that kind of pressure. And so we're taking, you know, what we did on all four of those films in a, in a, in a in, you know, under pressure and we're converting that into a very thoughtful, process for, develop, for developing scripts. That's great. And did I read that you're doing something with Poltergeist? Was that real? That was, I mean, that was something we were talking about. I don't know that that ultimately ever uh, um, came to fruition, but something that I loved as a kid. Yeah, and, I was going to say, yeah. it brings back a lot of <laughs> I was memories. interested in turning it into a, a television series. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Do you have favorite actors to work with? Do you, you know, do you make relationships on set or is everybody part of the family? I mean, there's certainly it's a family. There's no question. And, and we were really spoiled. I mean, you, you have Oscar winners who are showing up to day play on your movies. That's absurd. Um, and again, that just speaks to the uniqueness of the Marvel universe and its place in, in, in movies. Um, we love all different processes. And I think that's part of what's fun is having so many great actors uh, on these films is that they all bring a different process to it. And it keeps it exciting as a director because every day someone else is showing up where and Chris Evans and Scarlett Johansson are very technical, you know, it, 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 very gifted on a technical level where Scarlett's a one taker. I mean, you could literally say to her, okay, here's what the intention of the scene is and I need you to cry somewhere between these two lines and <laughs> take one. You know, she can turn it on and, and you know, you're like, ah, well, I don't know what else to ask for from her after that take. We just got it. 
Um, uh, and there's other, there's other actors who like to you know, try six, seven, Mark Ruffalo, like you could, you could shoot him all day long because he just likes to keep trying different things. Downey will never say the same line twice. He's got a really <laughs> unique process where he has an earwig in and he has an assistant who's been working with him for years. And what we'll do is like on a Sunday before we shoot his scenes for the week, we'll get in a room with him and the writers and pitch out alternate lines because he wants to keep it alive every take. So then he'll do a take scripted and then uh, his assistant will feed him the alts. He'll do an, the scene again with the alts. His assistant will f feed him the next round of alts. He'll do the scene again with another round of alts. And what's great is that after four takes, we can look at everything he's done and we can kind of pick and choose and rebuild it. And then he'll do it one more time with sort of you know, everything that seemed to work the best. Uh, that's a very different process than say yeah. Scarlett's process. So it's exciting. Uh, to work with with such a range of talent. Yeah, what an incredible group of talent for yeah. this one in particular. Okay, so now that you have the highest grossing film of all time, are you going to go to your high school reunion in Ohio? <laughs> You're like, hey, I'm bad. Joe. Been, what have you been up to? <laughs> I haven't been to one in years, but I mean, it's, uh, you know, the thing about these films is that you can never sort of target how they, they're going to be received. The, the fan base is fickle, to say the least, uh, and very passionate. Uh, and, um, and we've been very grateful because we have told four stories that were very personal to us and that we were very passionate about and people did respond to them and that's the, the most gratifying uh, aspect to it. Definitely, thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna take a couple of questions but first uh, I'll take one from the Dory which is how do you find your comedy directing background on community and arrested development influenced your approach to these? Well, certainly with both those shows, we were working with a lot of cast. And you know, there's real discipline in uh, um, TV comedy because you have 21 minutes to tell a story. And both Arrested and Community were very ambitious shows from a character standpoint. So you know, we would, sometimes we'd have 20 characters in 21 minutes and you'd try to track like, six or seven of them through an episode. Uh, and that just teaches you a process of, one, developing to, to be able to achieve that, uh, so developing your script correctly, and two, when you execute on set, what is required to do that, and the amount of time it takes to do that. So certainly there was carryover, and we learned a lot from, from um, uh, TV that we brought to film. What about time travel, now that it's been introduced? <laughs> how do you raise the stakes from here? How do you help audiences care about the heroes of the MCU when they know that there may be infinite of alternate copies out there? I mean, ultimately, I think that you're just, you know, you're, you're paying attention to the story that you're watching. Yeah. And that there are stakes in the story that you're watching. I guess you can get into sort of theoretical or, you know, philosophical conundrums, but... I mean, I, I think ultimately when you sit in a theater and you're engaged by a narrative, you're going to feel the narrative. You can leave the theater and think about, well, I guess they, you know, there's an infinite amount of stories that could have played out. Sure, but that's not the one that you watched. Uh, I think it's compelling because I think it, it offers a lot of opportunity for really unique storytelling. And I think what, when I said earlier that we all have PhDs in content consumption, this young lady right here, that young man right there can get 10 minutes into a commercial movie and you can lean over and ask them what's gonna happen and they'll tell you because they've seen the same narrative structure over and over and over again. And, uh, and I think that, you know, that it's, it's you know, part of the reason that our movies worked at Marvel is because we had a very simple formula and it was about disruption. And if you look at all of our films, they're, they're very disruptive to the main narrative. Winter Soldier takes the bad guys and turns them in, uh, takes the good guys, turns them into the bad guys. Civil War takes your heroes and pits them against each other in a fight. Infinity War, we kill half your favorite heroes. The end of, <laughs> at the end of Endgame, we kill your favorite hero. These are disruptive choices <laughs> yes. that surprise you, make you feel, engage you in conversation. These are critically important, so I think that you know, what I like about the time travel is that it, it offers an incredible amount of disruption. Yeah. There's a lot of directions that the story can go in from here, and they don't have to be linear, which I also think is deadly 
to traditional narrative storytelling. Well, you've definitely figured that out yeah. with the end game. It was great. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question live, there's uh, microphones on either side here. Hi, Joe. Thank you for being here. Uh, first of all, the movie was amazing. The fact of being able to like cry and laugh and like get excited at the same time was amazing. I wanted to ask you a question, and it goes really in line with time traveling. If you could travel back in time for this movie, what would you change? You know, it's interesting. People ask us that a lot. And it's, these, pro the, these projects are so iterative, and their resources, to a certain extent, are almost unlimited that you know, if we regret anything by the end of it, we did not do our jobs correctly. And you know, our, our process is really vigilant. As, as we're making the film, you know, we're shooting for a year. So something we shot two months in, we can watch three months later in the edit room and decide we don't like the performance, we didn't like the tone, we didn't get the joke right, we didn't get the emotion right, and we reshoot it. And so all the way up until we deliver these movies, that, the famous I Am Iron Man line was literally shot like two months before this film was in theaters. So this is a, you know, it, it's just a, it's a, it's an exceedingly iterative process and its only limits are how much you know, sleep you need to get at some point. But, um, so I don't know, we really don't regret anything about it. We're, we're very happy with how it turned out. That's a, that's a benefit, that's a nice thing to say. Uh, so actors are interested, fans are waiting, Harmon is willing. Have you considered taking on the community movie? I mean, I think it would be, as I said, I think it's a, a, a real tragedy if, if we don't complete the uh, and a movie to six seasons in a movie. So uh, I, I'd love to see it get done. I think it, it just requires like wrangling everybody, people around projects, Donald's very hard to get on a phone. So it would, it would just require some, some strategy, but I think it, it can be done. Well, you've demonstrated you can do a lot of yeah. great things. So we'll, I think we heard it here, yes. expect it. Yeah. Another question from the group. At Google, we take on ambitious projects that involve hundreds or thousands of people working towards a single goal. This is a good uh, example. Can you share tips on how you deliver your projects? You said you had 6,000 people working at one time. How do you do that on time, on budget, with that quality? There's a couple of key ingredients. One is that you need to be a great collaborator. Because you cannot, I, there's no universe that my brother and I could have accomplished making those movies alone. We had key, key collaborators through all four films that we worked with, from our VFX supervisor to our editor to our DP uh, um, to Marcus and McFeely. These are, these are critical collaborators that you have to empower and give emotional ownership to so that they are just as invested in, in the project as you are every step of the way. And then those key collaborators then in turn have to do that to their silo of, of crews. And I think that, that's an incredible, incredibly important part of it, collaboration and emotional uh, ownership. And then as a leader, I think what is most important is being decisive. You have to, you have to make decisions. You have to make them quickly under pressure. And I always say this to young filmmakers. I say, make a decision. If you find out 24 hours later it's the wrong decision, figure out how to make it the right decision, right? By retrofitting and, and and, and pivoting and, and until you get to where uh, uh, you need to go. Uh, and then you have to be able to, once you make a decision, you have to be able to communicate that to people. Uh, and I, so I think communication skills are incredibly important and in being um, concise in the way that you communicate. So in two sentences, being able to tell someone what it is you need from them for the next week is, uh, is, is really important as well. And how do you think about that with feedback? Are you, uh, so you enroll everyone in the vision and sort of give them the autonomy to do it, but then do they need a lot of feedback? Do you provide a lot of feedback? Is it we sort do, of we have time? like, we have check-ins. Okay. You know, where we'll get everyone in a room for a group meeting, the heads of state, and, uh, and feedback comes out. And you're like, that's a, that's a great idea, let's incorporate that. I really like that idea, but that would send us backwards and I don't know that we have the time to go backwards and execute, or the money, you know. So it's sort of mm -hmm. a, you know, it's an idea farm, and you know, we're our, our number one motto is "best idea wins." Doesn't matter where it comes from, you know. And people also have access to us 24/7. So they have a question, they need something from us, they can call us, email us, text us, and we're incredibly responsive. Within, you know, minutes, they'll get an answer. Back to your lack of sleep. That's yeah. that's <laughs> it. That's what you sign up for. We have another question from the audience. Hey Joe, thanks for being here. Um, obviously, Endgame was an amazing movie. 
culmination of a 10-year storyline that either met or exceeded the wildest expectations that we had. There's another series that just recently finished, Game of Thrones, which actually followed a very different path, like did not meet any expectations. <laughs> Where do you think that's you your went opinion. right? I was just gonna say, that's, that's one opinion. opinion. I'll call it out, I'll call make it that out. clear, that is not my opinion. Uh, <laughs> Where do you think you went right with the Avengers storyline, and where did Game of Thrones go wrong? <laughs> this is like 20,000 headlines for the next three weeks <laughs> if I answer this question. Uh, I, look, I, it's, it's interesting being an artist in today's world <laughs> with social media because uh, it's, it's an unprecedented level of ownership that the viewer feels over the material. When I grew up, Ernest Hemingway wanted to write a book, he wrote a book, and uh, you read it, and you went, that's great, and amazing, and thank, thank you, Ernest Hemingway, for writing an incredible piece of literature. <laughs> and you know, you're very grateful for it. Today, rightly or wrongly, there is a, an, an intense amount of um, uh, um, ownership and, uh, and opinion. And opinions fly fast and furious, and I've learned this about social media, that, it, that there's, a, there's a minority of opinions that are very loud. And they tend to drive uh, uh, me, the media cycle in a way where it's, it's not healthy because you're not, you're not getting a true sampling of everyone's opinion. You, you know, it takes energy to go online and bitch about something. You know? And not all of us have that energy or care to do it. You know, there's also a little bit of narcissism that's involved <laughs> with getting online to complain about something. So you have to have a combination of those things in order to do that. And, uh, and I don't think that, that that is evocative of a large segment of society. I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm not answering your question directly. <laughs> that's okay, I'm, I'm trying to give, give you an a, out. But I'm you... trying to give you a version of an answer. So, uh, um, you know, they made the choices that they wanted to make with that show. And people felt that they, I think what they felt was that they didn't, they didn't feel that, that was, it was seeded properly throughout the series. Uh, uh, that some of the choices uh, seemed unexpected. There are very disruptive choices. I loved all the choices. I thought they were crazy and unexpected. Uh, and that's what I want out of a narrative. Um, but I see where people uh, feel like they were upset. Uh, and I think that ultimately that just goes down to like, an artist saying, well, here was our intention, and if you go back and look at it, you know, I, we think it's very carefully woven throughout. It may be very subtle, but it's in there. And, and a viewership going, well, we, 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 thought, we thought it was too subtle, and we're not following it. So um, it's, a unique, uh, it's a unique circumstance, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we didn't get uh, it's beat up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take another question. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Thank you for being with us. Sure. So as you mentioned, there were a lot of emotional moments within Endgame, yeah. ones that made the crowd cheer, laugh, cry. I'm curious, was it as emotional when you were filming it, or is it more like, you know, we film it, done, or it, does it really build up emotionally? It's, a, it's emotional. I mean, I, you know, scenes I still sort of tear up uh, oh. when I watch. I mean, there's... We put in moments that are emotionally profound to us. That's the way that we make these things because we feel like if they're emotionally profound to us that they may translate emotionally to an audience. So Hawkeye losing his family at the beginning. I, I've got four kids. I, I, I don't know that I could process that. I don't know how I would process it. That just felt like a really compelling way to open the movie. And every time I watch that scene, it gets me. Um, uh, you know, Tony Stark having to sacrifice himself, knowing that he's going to, you know, uh, his daughter's going to lose a father and his wife uh, is going to lose a husband. That, that is very complicated for me to think about. But I also know that's good storytelling and it's challenging storytelling. And I know it's another thing today is I find that people tend to view death as a, as a, as a negative in storytelling. I look at it as a, a, a positive because I think, we were talking about this earlier, we live in a world where you're either for the individual or you're for the community right now. And I think that what's compelling about Tony making that choice is he's making a choice for the community. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's a personal sacrifice. And that's what heroes do. And that's sort of the very definition of what a hero is. So I don't know that the movie could have ended any other way because 
a hero has to be willing to make the greatest sacrifice. That is why we commend them, and that is why we, we always think of them uh, uh, as the greatest amongst us, because they make those choices that, that are very difficult to make and that not all of us can make. Well, and I loved that you had Pepper tell him that it was okay. Like, go, it, and we're going to be fine. It, so. it's a group, it, it is a group you know, moment. It's a group decision. She says the same thing to him on the couch, is that I know who you are. I know that you can never rest until the job is done. And that's why I think Tony Stark was always fated to die, is because he's a hero who could never rest until the job was complete, and, the, and, the, and that mission required, ultimately, him losing his life. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. One last question. Karen asked the question of how you work with your brother. Um, so I was going to ask uh, some additional questions about that. Sure. Um, the first one is, do you, there are a lot of tasks that uh, directors have to do. Do you sort of gravitate toward certain things while he gravitates toward other things? And is it always consistent? And the other question That's a good is, question. Yeah. Um, do you ever get lost in kind of like idea sessions with him where you just keep throwing ideas around and, and never know which one to execute? No, we ideate all the time and I think that you have to put a limit on that because at some point you have to make a decision, like I said, move forward. Doing this for 25 years, you develop an instinct about when it's time to move on and when you have the correct idea. So it's hard to sort of ascribe a f you know, any kind of formula to that. Uh, and then as far as uh, us working together, I mean, you know, it's, we, we try not to divide up because we feel like the true value to the mastermind principle is that you want, you want the exponential brains on everything because that's where you get the exponential secret sauce. Um, and when you divide up, you sort of lose that. However, we have been doing this for so long together that we now know how each other thinks and we can check ourselves if the other one isn't there and go, no, my Anthony would say this in this situation. I need to think through this because this is where he would come at it from. And, uh, and so we have a, a little voice inside our head that represents the other one's point of view. Uh, but I do think that like, if you're working a group dynamic, it's always important to maintain that group I dynamic, at least for critical check-in moments. It's, it's, it's OK to let people go off and, and, and dream on their own and then come back. But I think you always have to come back to a group collective where the group can contribute. That's the reason you have a group dynamic. Well, Joe, on behalf of billions of fans around the world, thank you for all the joy, all the tears, all the laughter that you brought in Endgame and the other movies. And thank you to Marvel and Disney as well. It's really been a pleasure having you at Google. Well, thank you. And I just we I want to take the opportunity to thank the fans and to thank all of you. I mean, really, we make these movies for you. Uh, like I said, is a public medium, and uh, and you know we're very very grateful uh, that that people have responded to this movie the way that they have, uh, and uh, and it's it's very um, it's very important to us uh, that uh, you know that these films the way that we brought our family together uh, around a dinner table uh, that the, that these movies can bring people uh, around the world together uh, to have uh, shared experiences is. Um, is, is without question their, uh, their highest value. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.